I don't know anybody who is saying, I want to pay more taxes. Non-charitable purpose trust, <laughs> there's a lot of jargon there. Do you think your Wyoming LLC and its privacy is going to hold up against a federal indictment? There are people offering secrecy and most of them are fraudster. What is legitimate and what is illegitimate? Ultimate tax plan, it's a cool name. And uh, a bad idea to name anything that if you are going about it the right way. So let's see if they're going about it the right way, but I can tell you the end of the story right now. This is the first article and this is the second and this is him pleading guilty six months after to him being indicted. So that's pretty quick. This blew up fast and you'll see how obvious it is, but this is a clear case of everything that I continually discuss about there are legitimate ways and illegitimate ways. There are, again, good debtors, bad debtors. There are good structures with good intent. There are bad structures with bad intent. And if you think you have something cute and clever and you know behind there that there's a bad intent, it will be found out and this is going to be a clear cut case. So Michael Meyer, he was selling something called the ultimate tax plan. And the structure was um, quite simple actually. Once again, it's like the structures everybody draws. I drew it here with marker. Once again, marker and crayon and children's instruments are the right things to use to describe the sophistication of these. But I'll just read this out here. So according to the indictment, the way the ultimate tax plan worked was this. Meyer would form an LLC for a client. The client would then transfer cash and other assets into the LLC and take 100% ownership of it. And again, these are usually in Wyoming and Delaware and all these places that say that you have absolute privacy and confidentiality. It doesn't matter when this happens. Using paperwork drafted by Meyer, the client would then donate either 99% or 100% of the LLC to a Meyer controlled charity. With Meyer then signing an IRS form 8283 as the appraiser to vouch for the value of the LLC. So again, now an LLC is transferring its business interest, which is gonna be multiple things of course, but it's not transferring explicitly cash, right? If you donate $10 to a charity, okay, well we know what you donated. You don't have to have that valued, we know it's $10. When you're donating something else, art for example, we have to deal with appraising. What was that donation worth? That's a tax play, by the way, that a lot of people use. Some people use it legally, some illegally. But in the case of donating an LLC, once again has to be appraised. Meyer was the appraiser of the donation to his own controlled LLC. You should already see that there's some cracks within that. Is it independently valued? Is there a conflict of interest there? So we're already in dangerous territory, even if this was all legitimate, right? That's already quite dangerous because the allegation would just be that these are being improperly appraised to conduct something illicit, right? To get a larger tax break than you're entitled to, for example, which is something people get in trouble for all the time. But again, he was the appraiser. That's at the end of the day, the Meyer controlled charities, at least on paper, either 99% or 100% of the LLC was now under the charity and therefore get a charitable donation against the value of that appraised by him. And then the future income that that LLC received, if there was any income on the client's personal income tax return. That's how any charitable donation works. That, that's normal charitable activity from that perspective. Just there's, you know, some wrinkles there. But then the client then gets that double benefit, right, of both the deduction immediately for donating it and then the future deduction for the income that came into the LLC because now, once again, it's the interest that's donated to the charity, okay? So they get a double tax benefit. Once again, we're all kind of in okay territory, like this could be a real thing. And that's where he says, if the charity actually obtained value from the LLC and enjoyed the income flowing from the LLC, there would have been nothing wrong with this in theory because that's not what happened. So. I'm gonna go through a lot of these details, but first we're gonna look at this here. We have this structure. Once again, LLC that gets established. This is Y1, year one. We're moving 99% or more into the 501c3. We're gonna file our tax reduction forms that go to the UBO, the ultimate beneficial owner or I guess they're the client, but again, they're gonna be considered a UBO in this arrangement. And then somewhere down the road, what he's offering them in year X, so plus one, the 501c3 is gonna transfer back those assets to the LLC, but then they're going to value them differently. So right now we're at valuation 100, you know, again, whatever that means, full valuation, we could call it. And then a valuation of 1 10th, usually the valuation would be 10%. So it's transferring back what it's valuing at 10% compared to this, even though the assets remain the exact same. Does that make sense? Yeah, I hope we're following this. 
I know this can feel a little bit complicated, but do we see once again how this is a completely illegitimate idea where it's obviously a tax dodge? In addition, the way the client would then benefit, once again, the 501c3 never benefited from this, the client would loan against the asset that was still technically held in the LLC in order to get a tax-free loan on the purported value within the LLC that isn't supposed to be there because it's supposed to be in the charity. And the way that they pulled that off, quote unquote, legitimately within the filings at the time was by backdating different transactions. Okay, so the whole arrangement is the most basic type of fraud that you can ever imagine. But these are the types of plans that people put together and in six months unraveled. A lot of cases when people are trying to get away with things in a less obvious way, the cases sometimes take over a decade. This took six months. Okay, but these are the plans that I see people come up with all the time. Hey, wait a minute, if we just move something over there and then wait for six months or a year and then move it back, we'll get the benefit on this side and then we'll get the benefit on the other side. That's never how anything has worked. That's never how anything has actually come to fruition. And everyone involved, and likely all of the clients who got involved in this, I'm going to get in trouble. In the article, the bottom line was that the donations of the LLCs to the charities were a sham. This was not an actual charitable donation. And so this is where we have to go into, once again, the good versus bad. Charitable donations for the purpose of tax planning, in addition to asset protection, are legitimate things to do. The most recent and deeply famous case would be Patagonia. The founder of Patagonia moved all of those assets, donated the entire company for a charitable purpose. It didn't go into a 501c3, it went into a 501c4, which is a tax-exempt, non-charitable purpose trust. That's a lot. <laughs> There's a lot of jargon there. Slightly different than some of the laws within a 501c3, but the effect of it is the same. What's the difference? He donated all of his shares, just like this, into a 501c4, but again, very similar to this, received the exact same tax benefit, a wiping out of 700 million in taxes, right? This is one of the greatest tax plays ever. Legal tax plays done by the founder of Patagonia and his family. And it allows the non-charitable purpose trust, 501c4, to be the sole shareholder within the Patagonia Corporation and allow it to run as a for-profit corporation. Once again, they could have done that here too, okay? And the 501c4, because it's a non-charitable purpose trust, is allowed to generate a profit Profit. Now, of course, it pays taxes, but it can have ridiculous expenses because it has a purpose to engage in. Part of its purpose is to manage Patagonia for a purpose of being a charitable corporation that benefits the environment. And then the uh, non-charitable purpose trust itself has its own purpose of how it's meant to use its revenue. He has just secured hundreds of millions of dollars in tax savings legally and set up the next, I don't know how many generations of his family. Now, probably generation three will f it up because that's what happens with every third generation and virtually every family throughout human history. But still, that type of planning is the type of planning I'm talking about. Very sophisticated, getting a very similar effect here maintaining control, getting access, getting benefits from your wealth, still being able to control your business, wiping out taxes. But where was the big difference? One, it was done in the light. Two, it was done with a ridiculous amount of attorneys, tax attorneys, estate planners, financial advisors, you know, up and down on every level of this. And finally, the charity and the charitable purpose was real. This, however, did not have a legitimate purpose. It did not have a legitimate charitable aim. It was not set up with the aim at legitimacy. This charity didn't have an intent. The records for the charity. No, there are no records of its activities. What activity is going on within the charity? Nothing. There's no activity happening within those charities. Is there a brand for the charities? Where's the website? Where are its marketing materials? Where's its identity? Where does it pass out leaflets? Where does it do fundraising activities? That's what every charity in the world does. These ones aren't. Where are the communications showing its operations, showing its people talking about how it wants to help and provide some benefit to XYZ community? In the Patagonia case, we we have a legitimate intent. We have an actual purpose that's legally defined and legally substantive and supported within the legal records and the tax code. We have records of all that information and what it's doing and why and how. It has a brand, it has an identity, and it has communications about how it operates. That's the difference. Sham charities were set up in order to get a similar effect to the Patagonia plan. The difference was legitimacy, actuality, 
transparency, good ethical conduct. To me, this is celebratory. In my field, this is something to celebrate. This means you can get all of these benefits without breaking the law anymore. Once again, let's go back to the 90s. To get those benefits, the best way to do it was to break the law. It was simply the best way to do it. You didn't have to hire expensive people to do a bunch of things. You didn't have to go through bottlenecks of administration, compliance, KYC, documentation, record keeping, brand development, company development. That's hard and that takes time. Well, those loopholes have been closed, but you can still get all the benefit if you actually want to conduct legitimate activities. And in every case, it's possible. My only defense of this, and it's not a defense of this plan, because this plan is absurd. I love this one. Since 2013, Meyer and his co-conspirators earned more than $10 million from the execution of the ultimate tax plan. Meyer spent that income on personal expenses, including to purchase a multi-million dollar residential estate, a luxury vehicle collection, including Lamborghinis, Rolls Royces, Mercedes Benzes, a Bentley, and a Ferrari. Once again, charitable activities are reviewed and audited in order to maintain their tax compliance within you know, US federal code, specifically for being a current and approved 501c3 charitable organization. If you're buying Lamborghinis, Rolls Royces, Mercedes Benzes, a Bentley, and a Ferrari, I can't imagine what that's for. But let's go back to that $10 million mark in a moment, right? Because that's the total. His grand achievement with this was $10 million. Count one against him is conspiracy to defraud the United States. Meyer and two of his close associates and a few others unnamed at the time engaged in a conspiracy to commit tax fraud by the way of the ultimate tax plan. Among the allegations, uh, blah, 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 they illegally backdated transactions and other documents and falsified form 8283 knowingly. Okay, $10 million. Here's the problem here. And here's my, once again, I understand the clients to a certain extent and that this is of course difficult. Client one, backdated documents to get a $400,000 deduction. Client two and three, 881,000 and 640,000 respectively. Client four, 400,000 deduction. Additional deductions over the years of 320, 200, 391. What else do we have? Client seven, 360K. My empathy, I suppose, with these clients is that unfortunately these are clients that are just not very wealthy. They don't make very much money. If all of that hard work for Meyer makes him $10 million over a period of a decade, I would have no idea what to do with him. I would have no idea what tax planning to do with him because we don't work with a client that low value. I'm not trying to be insulting. I'm just trying to be clear about, I empathize with the problem that they face. There's challenges, particularly in the United States in terms of tax code. If you don't make hardly any money, you don't get taxed. And then this middle zone, you get obliterated. And then once you start making more than like $5 million, but definitely more than 10 million a year, we can start to wipe out taxes. There's a lot of things that are incentivized by the federal government to invest in that allow for incredible tax strategies that are legal and approved by the government. When you're in that middle zone, it's like you make too much money where you're getting nailed by tax, but not enough to invest in the tools to legally reduce it in a way that generates ROI for you. And so I get their frustration. They're saying, listen, we are in the 1%. Why are we still paying all these taxes? Well, I'm sorry, you're not in the 0.1%. Is that fair? Well, I don't know. That's a different conversation. I'm describing the law, I'm describing what happens. These guys are unfortunately stuck in the one to 2% which means you're wealthy, uh, but you pay a lot in tax, and there's basically nothing interesting that you can do about that. You're just gonna have to pay a lot of tax. So they just got frustrated with that. Again, that's not my policy. I'm not trying to change a law in any country. I'm not trying to make any political point or moral point or popular point or, or anything on the opposite end of that. No comment on that whatsoever. It's just these dollar amounts mean these are what I would describe in this world of high net worth planning. They're median net worth individuals, and there's very little that can be done for them. So that's my only comment for them. But the other area too, and this is a great situation because they got recorded conversations from Meyer that I think are great because this is another area where what's the phrase, the best way to tell a lie is to mask it in truth. The best way to sell a fraudulent structure is to structure it in a way that virtually everybody else would, or to have an aspect of that deal that's so consistent with everybody else's type of planning or type of business model. And this is about the buyout. You know how I said, right? They value it at 100 over here, and then they value it at 10% down here when they sell it back to you, and that's how you 
get this really good tax play and you get your money back. And this is how Meyer makes his money, is that delta, yeah? And so the buyouts have come back around 10 cents on the dollar. That's really what it comes down to. So if you got 1 million in there and you want to buy it back, it's going to cost you 100,000. Now you'll probably save yourself 300 or 400,000 in income tax when you put the 1 million in there because you got the tax deduction. So basically what he's saying, he's like, hey, you're putting a million over here. I've just saved you 300, 400 million in tax and then you buy it back and you pay me 100,000. So that's how I make my money, right? So you save money in tax, I make a portion of that savings. That's kind of like basic tax planning, I would say. And not just basic tax planning, that's the makeup of almost every good business arrangement in the world, particularly uh, entrepreneurs. I imagine these people are small business owners or something. Again, it's comment here, so it's a win-win, you know, for you and our charity at the same point in time, right? He's basically saying, hey, I'm gonna provide this benefit for you, and you're gonna get this benefit because of this plan that I put forward that you wouldn't have gotten. And then after you get that benefit, I want a piece of it. It's the most normal business arrangement in the world. That's what everybody should be doing. That's a good way to do business. It just so happens that in this case, it was also complete bullshit and complete fraud. So there's four points to conclude on here that you must take away. And this is all outlined in the analysis here. I, I very much enjoy, and they resonate with me very deeply. So the first one is this. It says here, criminal tax cases pose difficult problems for prosecutors. They're actually quite difficult because what you have to allege, right, the tax code is already complex and borderline indecipherable, which basically means, oh, and then also nobody likes the IRS. By de nobody likes the tax department by definition. And we're all justified to all want to reduce our taxes. We should all, we all have the legal right and I would say coherent logic to want to reduce our tax bill by any legal means necessary. That is the most legitimate activity that anybody could ever conduct, okay? So going out with that aim, saying I want to reduce my taxes to as low as I can through legal means is a legitimate activity. What they have to do in a criminal tax case is prove intent. And it's of course difficult to prove that somebody had the specific intent to do something illegal. I'm begging you. There's a hundred, there's a thousand, there's a hundred thousand legal ways to reduce your taxes. Don't pick the obviously illegal ones. And this one is obviously illegal, especially when we see how quick this went through. The backdating alone, somebody telling you, listen, we're going to falsify records. Okay, well, how is this ever going to be a thing that you think is going to be legitimate? Once again, please don't. It's so hard to prove criminal intent but this one is so obvious. Like, you just don't need to fall into a pit. I'm reminded of, God, what's that comedian? John Mulaney. He's talking about things that he was worried about as a kid, but never came up as an adult, right? And he's just like, as a kid, you know, I really thought quicksand was a big problem for people. I really was worried that quicksand was going to be a thing. This is how I feel about tax cases. It's like, this is such an easy thing not to mess up on such an easy thing like running into illegal tax situations is such an easy thing to avoid it's almost like how did you find the quicksand i've never even heard of anybody falling into quicksand in my entire life but people still run into this and they shouldn't because there's so many legal things that you can do intelligently and substantively second area and this is about marketing and i love this if a tax strategy or i would say asset protection strategy or any of these advanced planning wealth management strategies, gurus, influencers, TikTokers, all of these people. If they have a cute little name or wear a fancy hat or give their strategy a name, it probably doesn't work. The only reason one would give a name to a tax strategy would be for marketing purposes. And if a tax strategy is being marketed, then it is probably a tax shelter. And furthermore, the more something is marketed, the higher likelihood that the IRS will take an interest in it and try to stop it as an abusive tax shelter. Along with my problems with secrecy is cuteness, right? The cute strategy defense has never worked. Once again, marketing, it's got a cute name. The ultimate tax plan, the bridge trust is, you know, another one. They all create these branded names. There's no such thing in any law, in any statute, in any body of judicial record or commentary or precedent that talks about anything branded. They look at the actual tax code. They look at the way money moved. They looked at things like purpose and intent and record. Records, they go through the process of verification, due diligence, and discovery every single time. And these marketing gimmicks that they put a name around it, it's basically like saying, I have nothing of substance to say because this work by definition is a work of substance, and so I'm replacing it with brand. Never works. These things are illegitimate in every case that I've seen. Run the hell away from them. 
Tax planning is tax planning. When you set up a structure to reduce your taxes legally or to protect your wealth from litigation or anything like that, you're not using the cute name trust or the cute name tax plan. No, you should be given specific things of here's the vehicle that's being established. Here are the laws. Here are the precedents. Here's the exact deed and what it's doing. And here's where that money goes and why. And here's all of the people involved in this process, which then goes to point number three. The desirability of getting a second and maybe a third opinion about tax transactions or any legal structuring from an independent professional, or at least from multiple professionals. Once again, this is the basis of anything that we do. I realize that right now, this is even an interesting thing, that I am myself recording content. I am trying to do marketing, okay? I am trying to get a message out there about how to go about this business. And I realized that the moment after I get done with this, I have a call with one of our legal tax researchers in the US and our tax attorney in the US and our trust attorney in the Cook Islands, where we are setting up a structure for somebody and we are bringing the entire team to discuss the plan on dealing with an $80 million asset sale and how we structure that to minimize their taxes legally through US tax code. That's how it works. That's the only way it works. You have to have an entire team. You have to have a coalition of people, attorneys, tax attorneys, private bankers, who all have a public profile, whose faces are on a website out there, whose, whose name is, is in the public eye, who have a, a long track record and reputation of working with people all over legitimately, in, typically in multiple countries when we're dealing with international planning. And if that's not the case, then what are you doing? You're not trying to do anything legitimate. You're obviously going about this the wrong way and the person talking to you is not a legitimate commentator on the subject. So you're always gonna need multiple parties that get involved, especially because when we're dealing with the depth, complexity, and substance of both domestic and also international tax planning, no one person has the mind to canvas that entire field. You need multiple parties to ensure that we are staying within compliance on all of the areas because you can get tripped up. You can always get tripped up. That's why you have a team and you have a group of people that are all signing their goddamn names to it. And if you're not doing that, then again, you're just speaking to a marketer, not a team of professionals. And I don't know a single professional advisor, whether it's in law, finance, tax, banking, or within the professional services that relate to all of these. I don't know one single advisor who works completely independently under a single brand that is selling a big gargantuan tax plan and they don't work with any other series of professionals that has to sanction their activity, which comes to the perfect and most final point right at the end here. That somebody wants to avoid paying taxes does not mean they can abandon common sense. This is all common sense. You don't have to know one law to understand why Mike Meyer pled guilty almost instantly when this thing went to court. Don't do it. And the great thing is, is you don't have to do it. You don't have to do any of this. You likely have a legitimate path to a legitimate tax play. Now, if you only make a million or two dollars like these clients, I unfortunately can't comment on that because I don't know very much about median net worth tax planning or asset protection structures. But if you're making beyond that, you should uh, take a lesson from people who are far below you. You don't need to go down that route you can go the Patagonia route where you can save hundreds of millions in tax legally and be praised for it. We've talked about all the cases of fraud, obvious fraud. We've talked about the bad cases, of obviously trying to hide your money, obviously trying to get away with the tax play that is patently against the law and people going about things when they could have gone about them in the right way, where they could have updated something that has now fallen out of compliance into compliance or where they simply started on bad territory to begin with. And all of that's wrong. And there's no reason to do any of that because you can do it all legally. You can do this all transparently. You can get so many benefits and so many tools if you engage transparently. But there are some cases occasionally where people do try to do the right thing. They have the right intent. And because they didn't get proper advice, because they didn't work through the substance, because they didn't deal with the specifics, they still end up in a negative situation or with the outcome that they did not want. So one final case to talk about 
to explain this. And for the purposes here, because I don't want to get into the specific details of this exact case, because I don't want to get into the intent of the parties or anything like that for the moment, right? Let's assume good intent, because nobody has argued that intent was the problem within this one, okay? So um, let's for now just assume good intent. But this was a case where the mother of a woman who got married was donating assets to her daughter over many, many years. In those assets also included an irrevocable trust. It was a domestic trust in Michigan. When her daughter got divorced, the judge ruled that those assets must be split, even though it was all coming from the daughter's mother. All of the benefit was coming from her. And so in this sense, this is kind of just a very traditional desire for a family to pass down its wealth to their family and not necessarily include all of that wealth to the people that they marry. That's a legitimate thing to conduct. That's a legitimate activity, and we can understand why parents would want to ensure that only their children get the benefit of parts of their wealth, specifically trusts, and why nobody else would be a part of that, trying to keep it, you know, in the family, as it were, which is, and again, a totally allowable thing. But because they got tripped up in the differences between Massachusetts state law and Michigan state law, which, once again, they got into conflict between states. What's the dispute? Well, the divorce court is going to rule over the scenario where that is now a marital asset, even though they're saying, again, this husband who's now divorced, the wife, even though it came from the mother of the wife, right? They're saying, well, that happened during your marriage, therefore it's a marital asset. The wife was ordered to give distributions, even though the trust was set up perfectly, even though it was an independent trustee. She was still ordered to give 50% distributions to now her ex-husband. That is clearly a failure on planning. They did not have ill intent. They weren't trying to hide assets, as it were. That was a failure in planning. And there's two good implications here. One, because the wife was the sole beneficiary. Had she not been the sole beneficiary, this likely would have never happened. Once again, very improper trust structuring by the people who set this up. So there are many takeaways from this in terms of the lack of substance, but there's the three main takeaways. First, once again, the problem of domestic planning. If you're just looking at the domestic plan, you're going to trip over yourself in some way, shape, or form where different states are going to run into conflict, and it's not gonna to be to your benefit, typically. Once again, you're rolling the dice. Rolling the dice is not planning. Two, had there been multiple beneficiaries, this case likely would have never come about. But because the divorce attorney for the husband was able to argue that, listen, this trust is set up for the sole benefit of now my ex-wife, therefore I'm entitled to half of it. Had the mother set up a trust properly, which had multiple beneficiaries, in my opinion, basic standard practice, then she could have properly called this a family trust and he would not have been party to this. And finally, once again, a genuinely discretionary trust. It is not merely enough to have an irrevocable trust, but you must have a discretionary trust. The wife had interest, had guaranteed interest within the trust, which means the husband can say that my now ex-wife has a guaranteed interest within that trust. And so therefore, I'm therefore guaranteed half of that interest. A properly established discretionary trust is not gonna make such claims. So again, this is a case where nobody did anything illegal, but they did everything wrong because they weren't thorough enough. I'm not sure who advised them, but I know I would have done it very differently. And the case is very clear as to how to set these things up. And so once again, we come to the same conclusion, that if you want to do this planning properly, you have all of the law to your benefit, and the law and the precedent is literally telling you how to do this properly. All you have to do is go down that path.